It was epic. Can you think for a moment about an epic encounter in your life that impacted your life? Uh, one for me was that day I held my firstborn child in my arms. Seconds after being born, uh, just a wonder to behold. My new son, Jeremy, was an epic to behold. Uh, uh, this tiny human being, so wondrously bonded with me and Michelle. I, I'll never forget his fingers so tiny they would not even go around my thumb. Wow. And now he is taller than I am and reminds me that he can pick me up. Our two daughters came two and four years later, equally epic, I have to say that. Kaylee was born with these enormous eyes. Emily was born sooner than I was planning. The nurse, I won't forget, after taking care of Michelle, came over to me, looked me in the eyes, and quite sternly said, about time you got here. My three children, my three grandchildren, my wife, so much of me is who they are. And they continue to be epic encounters in my life each day. And yes, my epic list of people I've met uh, have so shaped me. Welcome to the first Sunday of this season called Lent. Uh, and we're going to be thinking about epic encounters in Lent. The word Lent comes from how folks years ago noticed the days leading towards Easter were lengthening. Lent comes from lengthen. Right. Uh, uh, Lent also comes from your dryer. But, uh, but the Christian season of Lent comes from this sense of lengthening daylight each day as we prepare for celebrating the resurrection. For Christians, it was lengthening time to pray, lengthening time to listen, lengthening time to change habits that would prepare us to clean up our living, to make changes for health, to be ready for Resurrection Day. And so for this season of Lent at Northminster, we're going to be thinking about epic encounters with Jesus. We're going to be thinking of stories each week from the Bible about human beings who encountered Jesus and were radically changed. And so let's get started. As we go to the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, early on, word was getting out about this special man from Nazareth. This Jesus was attracting attention. And in our scripture reading today, we have an epic encounter. It's in John chapter 1. If you brought your Bibles, we're going to pick up the story at verse 35, which we began Wednesday night at our Ash Wednesday service. The next day, John was there. This is John the Baptist, John. He was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew Simon Peter's brother was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him 
to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Holy God, we thank you for this reading of your word. Help us, Lord, in these moments to listen for you, to rely upon you. Help us, Holy Spirit, to come and see and to follow in faith. Amen. Simon says, good. Today we have a glimpse of Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, as I said, uh, John the baptizer, and Jesus. And it's epic. Uh, Simon would say to us today, listen up, this is an epic story. And he would ask us after hearing this story, are you walking with this Messiah as I did? One day there was a mom who shouted to her son, Johnny, tell your sister to come in, uh, to come inside and get out of the rain. And the boy yelled back, I can't, mom. And the mother replied, and why can't you? And he yelled in return, it's because we're playing Noah's Ark, mom, and she's one of the sinners. <laughs> Ever feel like just one of the sinners? On the outside looking in, or as Joe Walsh sings, I'm just looking for clues at the scene of the crime. And how would you feel if you were given an opportunity to come in from the cold, to find a way to get to know this real living God of the universe, who not only is a God of love, but loves you and wants to lead you to a better place, a place of peace. If Jesus came walking into this sanctuary today, wouldn't that be epic? I want to throw out a giant idea and warning. I believe Jesus is here with us right now through the mystery but also ministry of God's Holy Spirit. And I want to give you this morning an opportunity to respond to him and begin walking with him. Perhaps renew your walk with him and to follow him each day into a changed destiny of your life. It's a spiritual thing, it's a real life thing, it's a you and relationship thing, but above all things, it is a God thing in you. Jesus is here, it's epic. And so can we explore this morning from our reading what it means to follow Jesus? Number one, following Jesus means getting a divine clue and stepping out, stepping forward in faith. You know, just before our scene, we read and we looked at it Wednesday night, John the Baptist was given this epic vision of God the day before. He saw a vision of the Holy Spirit of God descending like a dove on this Jesus of Nazareth when he was baptized. Can you imagine? J John was given this warning. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is God's chosen one. And it happened. <laughs> it was epic. This vision fulfilled. This man from Nazareth, the dove came down and remained on him. John declared, I saw the Spirit come down. And so the next day when he is out with his disciples, Jesus passed by and John speaks up. Look, the Lamb of God. It's quite a statement. What a thing to say. And you know, we always have to be careful uh, if you're a Bible reader of what I call the reading dullness syndrome. And John said, look, the Lamb of God. I don't think that's how it happened. Look, look, that's him. That is the Lamb of God. It's a title for Jesus that implies here is one who is an unblemished lamb 
Uh, the, the kind of lamb they would know was offered on the Day of Atonement in the temple. In fact, it's such an impressive statement that his own two disciples go off, leave him to catch up with Jesus. See ya, John. Now, and that's impressive. It was exceptional in his day and time for a teaching rabbi to recommend a greater rabbi to his own disciples. But this is what John is doing. And off they go. They heard something epic about this Jesus, and they didn't just ponder it. They didn't just think about it. They did something. They went after him. They followed him. You know, I have up here an invitation I received a week and a half ago. I printed it out. Uh, a, a dear brother was inviting me to be a part of a retreat. Um, and it's a retreat I've attended and uh, helped with in years past. I'm not able to go this year. Um, but you know when you receive an invitation, RSVP, do you just ignore it? No, you respond. Yes or no? I hope during this season of Lent, uh, today even, that there may be an invitation of God's Spirit upon you and that you'll respond. Um, I think we hear clues and invitations from God throughout our lives. It might be a comment a friend says to you. It, it might be an interruption that you weren't expecting, but on a deep level. It might be a scripture you read on a card or in a story or something you hear in a movie that speaks to you in your heart. Maybe it's the memory of a loved one that just keeps tugging at you. When the two disciples heard him, John the Baptist, say this, they followed Jesus. They heard an invitation inside and they acted on it. I hope we are noticing the clues God is giving us these days and that we're acting on them, stepping out in faith. You know, stepping out in faith might seem to you like coming forward at a Billy Graham stadium revival, but sometimes it's just continuing to ponder, think, and talk with someone, take steps of faith to try out this Jesus. And so friends, firstly, following Jesus is getting divine invitations, ideas about Jesus, and trying him out in faith. Secondly, following Jesus means finding what you really want as an unfolding process, journey of life. These two men walk with Jesus, and he asks quite a question. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asks, What do you want? What do you want from me? What do you want from life? And they respond with typical Middle Eastern hospitality. They say, Rabbi, uh, where are you staying? And Jesus replies, Come, you will see. I believe Jesus was asking them at point value, are you just curious about me, just watching? Or are you serious about finding something? What is it you want? Because if you're serious about your life with God, you will go to him, you will learn from him, you will inquire even more, you will read, you'll study, you'll act in ways of finding this Jesus. You know, some of my favorite vacation trips in my life have been, one of the, have been those that were not well planned. Uh, when I was younger, my folks and I would go on vacation road trips, and my dad had a, let's just see what each day holds kind of a planning. <laughs> if, if you're OCD, it would drive you crazy. Uh, he would just say, let's drive west on this one trip. Let's just drive west and just go where we want each day. And let's explore the West, and we'll see where the road leads us. And Andy, we want you to come along to carry all the luggage. They were great trips. But traveling that way has a spirit of adventure. Every night, my folks would say, where should we go tomorrow? 
Well, I think that's an image of our life with Jesus. It unfolds each day. And we learn more and more about Jesus as we live one day at a time, as we talk with others, as we work and serve together, as we get to know one another, pray together, reach out together. Jesus is asking us this morning, what do you want, really want? What are you hereafter? And what does it have to do with your hereafter? One of my favorite writers, and he also was a pastor, Will Williman, he talks about one day there was a woman in his church who worked usually three nights a week at their church's homeless center. And one day he just praised her for her great faith. And she replied, great faith? Me? I don't think so. She goes, I really don't have that much faith. That's the point of why I do this. I do this because I need all the help I can get in seeing Jesus, understanding him, being with him. And so following Jesus is getting a divine clue and stepping forward in faith. Secondly, it's finding out what you really want in life with God as an unfolding life journey. Thirdly, following Jesus means finding a good thing that you begin to want to share with others. After spending only one day with Jesus, look at what Andrew does. The first thing Andrew did was go find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, the Christ. Now, did he have to do that? Was this a commission thing? Was this sort of like a frequent faith sir club? Did, did Andrew get points on his credit card for every person he brought to Jesus? No, he did this, my theory, because he just wanted to. Pure and simple. It came from his caring, compassionate heart. And please, let's note here that Andrew, especially at this point, was not a Jesus expert. And he's teaching us today that you don't need to go to seminary to talk about Jesus and God in your life with someone else. You don't have to have a memorized spiel. You don't have to have a degree in Christianity. No, for Andrew, he simply is showing us what I'm calling is the I found a good thing model of evangelism. Step one, you think and find those you care about. I think Andrew had a little nanosecond light bulb moment. Who do I need to tell about this? My brother. Boom. Secondly, you tell those you know about what you know of Jesus. That's it. Andrew's comment was, I think we have found the Messiah That's, we've been, that we have been waiting for years. And Andrew was right. The charming thing is there was so much about Jesus he did not yet know. But he knew he was on to something. He knew something bigger than him was in this individual from Nazareth. Right. Thirdly, you bring that person to Jesus. Now you don't physically pick them up, tie them to a pew. No, no, that's illegal. Don't do that. But Andrew brought his brother to Jesus. It's an act of meaningful invitation. Come with me and see. Friends, I think these three simple things can open up a world of faith in God to someone you know. You don't force anyone to do anything. You're not trying to win a debate. You just share with joy who Jesus is for you, what this means for you with someone you care about. And you invite them to come with you to a faith event, a worship service, a group of friends having coffee. You know, you all know we live in a world, especially our country, of advertisements and appeals. It's all around. But I want you to know your personal life story and experience with God, with Jesus, shared with people you know, is the best appeal Jesus could ever have. Years ago, the Chevrolet Motor Company 
had been trying for years to sell their Nova to uh, the people of Mexico, Central America, and they were having lagging sales. And then finally, a light bulb turned on. Someone realized that the name Nova means no go. You know, keeping your faith in Jesus a secret is a no-go. Talking about your faith is not a secret. It's also not a slogan. It's your story. And God wants you to share it, show it. And so quickly, let me remind you about our REACH uh, philosophy of this church. I think it's one of the best ways to do your mission work. The reach appeal works like this. Number one, be intentional. Make, jot down a list of the people in your life. The people you're related to, that live nearby, the people you study with, work with, see every week. Write their names down. Secondly, pray for those people every day if you can. Uh, name their names before God. Lord, I'm praying for these folks. Number three, invest in them. This is the work of love. How can I bless them? How can I bless them, Lord? Number four, invite them to Jesus' experiences, whether it's worship, church, a study group, uh, a concert, an event. And number five, make it a life goal to continually be preparing for God to be working in you to be his witness in who you are. All right, so we follow Jesus to recap in the way God gives us clues and insights and we step forward in faith. Secondly, we follow Jesus as a continual process or journey of life. Thirdly, we follow Jesus in the way we share him with those we care about. And lastly, following Jesus means finding who you were meant to be and that you have a destiny in God's plan. It's quite striking. Jesus looks at Simon, the brother, and he says, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Simon was a very common name back then. Jesus says, You're John's son, Simon. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to speak of of Simon's future, his destiny. He says, you're going to be known in a whole new way, Peter. Now, at that time, Peter was not a common name, in, but its original form, the name Peter, means rock. Jesus was saying, you will be called the rock. One of my favorite New Testament scholars, Dale Bruner, uh, has taught on this. And he says, this was like a nickname Jesus was giving him. You are Rocky. And like Rocky, you will be my champ. And you will be the rock I will build my church on. I want to ask you this morning, how would you like to be known in your life uh, when you grow up uh, this week? In terms of your destiny, how do you want to be known or remembered as? Is it just, well, I was a teacher? Or, well, my destiny is to now be retired? Or, uh, my hope was to be a good parent? You know, Lily Tomlin once said, I always wanted to be somebody, but I guess I should have been more specific. Specifically, can you see a bigger destiny and calling in who you are with God? And how you, in your own unique way, can be a rock of God's spirit where he places you? You know, I have a piece of rock up here with me today. Um, and it reminds me, you know, we all can be a rock of Jesus. That he, God created this, and it's strong, it's secure. But when you open your life in faith to Jesus, like this geode, they're sparkling on the inside. And it's, one, it's a wonder to behold. And like this little rock geode symbol, we were meant as we're broken open 
to reflect the light of this living Savior in marvelous ways for people to see. Your life with Jesus has a destiny of being a blessing of God's light and love that will save other people from their sins, from their struggles, from their grief, even death. The writer James Moore once wrote about a fire that broke out in a hotel in Chicago, and he describes how the fire and smoke uh, blocked the normal escape routes. There were people up on the 10th floor who panicked, and they were gathered on a balcony outside to get air, but they were, they, they were trapped there. But there was one man who had found a way out to take a bold risk, and he plunged back into the building and found a way, found a way to get back up to that balcony to lead others out. As one man in the group later said, you can't imagine the feeling of relief when he appeared and and that he had come back for us. And he said to us, this way out, follow me. I know the way. James Moore says, this is what the Christian gospel is about. It's saying to us and others, Jesus is saying, this is your way out. Follow me. I am the way. Now, sadly, Moore reports that there were some on that balcony who refused to risk and go back with that man. They chose to stay where they were, and they perished. So here's an epic encounter question for us today. Will you go with Jesus this morning? Will you recommit your life to going with Jesus and to live for his mission of love in this world? I wrote out a simple prayer we can use today, um, and Dion will put it up. This prayer has a typo in it, but I think it might be a godly devised typo. Dear Jesus, I believe I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my errors, failures, and sins. Today, I open the door of my life and invite you to be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Please be in the center of who I can become. Help me to follow you, to love for you. Make me the person you want me to be in you. Amen. That's the prayer. And I'd like to close now by inviting you, any of you who feel called to respond, uh, to say this prayer with me. It can be a prayer of new beginnings, a new life. It can be a prayer for you that is a prayer of renewal and recommitment. Dear Jesus, I believe I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my errors, failures, and sins. Today I open the door of my life and invite you to be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Please be in the center of who I can become. Help me to follow you, to love for you. Make me the person you want me to be in you. Amen.